Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel and welcome to using multiplexer and demultiplexer ICs to route electrical signals. And this is part four in a four part series on solid state switching. Before I get started, I'll just mention, please check me out on Patreon. I have some really cool exclusive content from this video series and there'll be some from this video in particular. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the Forstronics YouTube channel. And if you like what you see here on this video, please hit the thumbs up. All right, let's get started. Okay, this is a four part series. We're on part four and part one. We talked about N and P channel MOSFETs using them as discrete devices to route electrical signals. In part two, we talked about Triax, a little known solid state switching device that can be used for switching AC line power. In part three, we went into using solid state relays or SSRs to route electrical signals. And in part four, we're gonna talk about multiplexer and demultiplexer ICs Sometimes you call them MUX or DMUX. And we'll talk about what multiplexers and demultiplexers are. We'll talk about the two main types, analog and digital. We'll also do an overview of example architecture. I will say for the overview of the example architecture, I am expecting the watcher to have a basic knowledge of digital logic gates and MOSFETs. If you don't, that's all right, but it'll be easier to follow along if you do. And then I'll finish with a demo. For Patreon, I'm gonna do a little bit longer demo with a little bit more circuit implementation information. Okay, then also on Patreon, I have this Forstronics wireless switch design, which corresponds to this switching series as well as the one I did before that on mechanical relays. So this switch design has mechanical relays, it has solid state switching devices, it can switch you know, fairly high power DC signals, as well as AC line power. It has an ESP32, so you can control it wirelessly. So on Patreon, I provide the PCB design files for this. I provide the Gerber files, the BOM, the PDFs of, a, of the schematics. And then I also give a code example where you control the switches from the cloud. Okay, what is a multiplexer and a demultiplexer? So a multiplexer is a switching device that has multiple switches built in where you can take multiple input signals and route them to a single output. Typically, the multiplexer will be some power of two to one. So in this case, it's two to the second power, which is four. A lot of times you'll see them in eight and 16. And then typically for control, they just use digital logic. And in this case, since the inputs are four, we need four discrete states to select the input. Two to the power of two is how we get four. Well, usually the power is how you get the number of control logic signals you need. So for instance, if S1 and S0 is one, one, that can control the switch for one of the inputs. If it's zero, one, then that can control the switch for the other one. If it's one, zero, that's another, and then zero, zero. So that's how you could control it to route the signals from I0 through I3 to Y. And then demultiplexers are basically the same thing, except the signal flow is going in the other direction. So you have a single input going to multiple outputs. Okay, and there's two main types of multiplexers and demultiplexers. The first one I sort of already just talked about, that's analog. Analog multiplexers and demultiplexers typically are bi-directional, meaning you can route signals in either direction. And so in that case, they're a multiplexer and demultiplexer in one. A lot of times I just call them multiplexers. I personally don't use the word demux or demultiplexer much. For the analog multiplexers, you can get them in a variety of frequency bandwidths from DC to RF. Typically, the higher the frequency, the more expensive they're gonna be. You could also use analog multiplexers and demultiplexers to route digital signals if you wanted to. And I provide two example model numbers. We'll look at the first one, the eight to one analog multiplexer, demultiplexer. We'll look at their data sheet, we'll look at their architecture and we'll show them in the demo. The second one that ends with a 52D is essentially just two four to one analog multiplexer, demultiplexers very similar to the first one, except you just get two four to ones instead of one eight to one. And this is good for if you need two multiplexers, but it's also good for differential signals, you could route it. And then the second type you typically have is digital multiplexer. So this is for routing digital control signals or possibly digital communication signals. 
These are typically unidirectional. So if you buy a multiplexer, it's only going to work as a multiplexer. And if you buy a D multiplexer, the signals can only go in the direction of a D multiplexer. So I'll show an example for a data sheet for the SN74HCS251 from TI. And this is an eight to one multiplexer with a three state output. And I'll talk about what that means. It also has SMIT triggers on the inputs and a bandwidth of about 20 megahertz for digital signals, not analog bandwidth. And once again, digital, I'm, I'm showing an example one, but they come in a variety of bandwidths, right? So if you're working with high speed digital communications, you have to go with a higher bandwidth. All right, so look, let's look at these example analog and digital multiplexers closer. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna start with the digital multiplexer from TI. So here we can see its basic block diagram. D0 through D7 are the inputs. This is a multiplexer. So you have eight inputs. Y is the output. And then W is also an output, but W is the inverse of Y. So the whole idea here is if you have a high on D1 and you're setting your control signals to route D1, let's say D1's high, it routes to Y, you'll get a high here and you'll get a low at W. A, B, and C are our control signals, right? So eight, we have eight inputs, which is two to the three. So we need three control signals to give us eight discrete states so we can route the signal we wanna to route to the output. This OE not is basically a way to shut off the output. So when it's low, the outputs are on. When it's high, the outputs are off and it doesn't matter what you have as the input of A, B, and C. Now you can see this is all made up of mainly logic gates. So you can see they're using an AND gate to control the different inputs to the output. But also notice here you have buffer amp with this symbol in the middle. This means it's a Schmidt trigger. Right, this kind of a cursive look of an eye here. And so this is a nice feature on here because what a Schmidt trigger does is it takes a noisy or malformed pulse or square wave and cleans it up to a square wave with sharp rise and fall times. So it can be better read by digital circuits. So this is really good if you're in like an industrial application and maybe your signal sort of gets flattened and loses amplitude because maybe it's going down long cables and maybe it's a noisy environment so it's picking up noise. So as long as you can hit the threshold of this Schmidt trigger, you're gonna clean up that mal-shape and pulse into a nice pulse with a fast rise and fall time. One thing I didn't get to mention is it said in the description that it's CMOS three-state outputs. A lot of times they refer to that as tri-state. So when they say three states, they mean the output can be high or low, right? An active high, meaning it has some ability to pull whatever it's connected to high and an active low, which means it has some ability to pull whatever it's connected to, to an active low. Well, its third state is high impedance. So when you tie this pin to high, you're gonna shut these output off. And you might say, well, doesn't that mean it's a low? Not necessarily, it's gonna be real high impedance, so it's gonna be sort of floating, or whatever line it's connected to will drive whether it's high or low. So that's why they say it's a three state device. Okay, here is the eight to one analog multiplexer or D multiplexer. One thing I wanna show you is it does have a wide range, meaning it can be negative voltage or positive voltage for the analog signal that's inputted. But this range is dependent on whatever power supplies you're feeding to it. And we'll see that in the block diagram. Another thing I wanted to make sure you're aware of is these switches don't have real low resistance or these muxes, these analog muxes that are solid state. So you can see their signal path resistance is gonna be 60 to 80 ohms, right? So these are made to send through low power analog signals where you're connected to some type of high impedance device, like an ADC. They're not meant for high power analog signals because you're gonna to get too much of power dropped across the IC. And of course, that'll probably burn up the IC. Now they do make higher power ones, I don't have too much experience with them, but just keep in mind, their on resistance might be a little higher than you first think. Okay, here's a block diagram of the chip. So we have our control signals. So it's eight to one, so we have three control signals again, S0, S1, S2. E0 is similar to what we saw on the other chip. So if E0 is tied to low, then all the paths can be activated using S0, S1, and S2. If you tie E0 to one, then all signal paths are shut off no matter what the control signals are to the chip. 
The positive power supply is VCC, and it can go up the 5 volts, but it could be lower. Then you have ground, and then you have VEE. VEE is basically your negative power supply. So if you want to have a negative analog signal, you need this power supply to be negative. Once again, VCC and VEE set the range of the analog amplitudes that can flow through the IC. Y0 through Y7, of, of course, are the input or outputs with the different signal paths, and then Z is the sing single signal path side. The last thing related to architecture I wanted to show is for the analog multiplexer, the 74HC451D. So I wanted to kind of just show you the architecture and how it works. So this is for having signal flow from a single channel to Z. So this could be Y0, Y1, Y2, whatever. They're all the same. And so you have a control signal that comes in here, right? So we have the three control signals, but eventually they get broken down into single control signals that go to a single switch. So that's what they're showing here. So we have some logic gates and then we have some MOSFETs. And if you notice, we have um, N channel and P channel, which helps allow signals to flow from Y to Z and Z to Y. We also have these diodes. So these diodes are meant to protect the IC. So the idea is if you have a positive amplitude that's over VCC, this diode will turn on and pull down that voltage level. Same if you have a signal that's more negative, the VEE. One thing the data sheet recommended is if you have a chance where it could be damaging signals, to put a current limiting resistor here. That way if the voltage goes too high, you won't get too much current through these diodes destroying them. The other thing I want to mention that might be a little different to some folks is MOSFETs are actually four terminal devices. When we did part one of this series, and when you look at discrete MOSFETs, they're usually three terminal devices, drain, gate, and source, right? And then they'll have N and P channel. The fourth terminal that typically is not available in discrete MOSFETs is the body terminal. Now, in discrete MOSFETs, they typically tie the body terminal through a diode to the source. But a lot of times in ICs, they actually use the body terminal. So that, that's why some of these MOSFETs have four terminals. So for instance, this one to the far left, which is a P-channel MOSFET, has a gate, a source, I should say, a drain, and a gate, and then the body. And what they do is they tie the body to VCC. The reason they do that is it actually allows you to adjust the threshold of the MOSFET. So if you remember, the threshold is what controls the MOSFET as a switch turning on, which means closing, or off, which means opening. Since the signal flow through these MOSFETs to the input or output is based on the value of VCC and VEE, that's what they're trying to enforce here. So they try to change the threshold level of the MOSFETs based on the power supply values you're using. So if we get a logic zero in, that means this switch should be off. So we, we get a zero to the AND gate. We go through a NOT gate, we get a one. We go through another NOT gate, we get a zero again. So we have two zeros going to an AND gate, which turns it to a one. But since we have this circle here, it means it's a NOT AND gate or a NAND gate. So we'll get a one on the output. Well, if we follow this one to a P-channel MOSFET, we know that the gate needs to be more negative than the source. So with a one here, that's pretty much gonna shut this off. It's also gonna shut this one off as well. For our NOR gate, we're gonna get a one here, then zero, one, and a one here. So on an OR gate, that would be a one out, but since this is a NOR gate, it's gonna be a zero. Well, that zero is gonna shut off this N-channel MOSFET, right? Because the gate needs to be more positive than the source. If we switch our logic states to a one, that's when we're turning on this switch path. So now we have a zero here, which is gonna help turn on these P-channel MOSFETs, and we're gonna get a one here, which is gonna turn on these N-channel MOSFETs. So with the N-channel MOSFET on here, we can get flow from Y through the drain to the source to Z. And with the P-channel MOSFET, we'll get current flow from Z through this MOSFET to Y. And once again, these over here will help for biasing depending on the value of VCC and VEE. So that's just a quick overview of how that analog switch for our MUX IC works. Okay, here we are for the demo. And what we're looking at is an LED driver board 
that can drive four different strings of LEDs and I have a lot of measurement and monitoring capabilities in so I know the power draw and I know to how to protect from an overcurrent condition. Here is the MUX IC. This is the same eight to one that we looked at in the data sheet and we looked at the switching architecture. The ESP32 is what I'm using to control it, right? The control to signal routing. And then here is my ADC chip that I'm routing the signals to. So right now I just have five signals connected to the eight channel MUX. And you can see a ribbon cable there. That's gonna route to these LED panels that I made. I have two of them. This right here with the green light, this is the bulk power supply. So this is inputting about 60 volts to the board. And then I have a cloud dashboard set up. And it's, this is a work in progress, so it's not finished. But if you notice, bus current, which is the total design current, is low. And then I have my individual LED string currents, which are zero. So right now I have power off to this. And by the way, I use a P-channel MOSFET to control power to turn it on and off. And that's what you're going to see. But the idea is all these current values come from one ADC channel and it's the MUX on the design that routes the uh, measured data to those, those panels you're seeing on this dashboard. So I turn it on and right away we can see the bus current goes up to 1.4 amps. I have the white LEDs all the way on so you see about one amp. And then I have some of the other LEDs only halfway on so you see lower than one amp. So my blue LEDs are about... 550 mill, milliamps. My red LEDs are about half two, and then my red LEDs are off. So that's why you're seeing that. So that's just trying to show you the, the MUX in, in action. And here's my LED boards that are on. In the video, it might look bright, but in person, it's a lot brighter. But anyway, that's an example application for an analog MUX. Okay, that's it for using multiplexer and demultiplexers I see to route electrical signals. And this is it for this four part series on solid state switching. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comment section. If you think I missed anything and you want to add something, please leave that in the comment section. And if you want the exclusive content, please check it out on Patreon. Thank you for watching.